I would remind you of what the Republican, uh, Republicans in the House did with Bill Clinton in 1998, right? And uh, we're not talking about that. It's not like there was some merry band of uh, camaraderie in the 1990s, right? Clearly not. So, I mean, yeah, No, but to your not. point that, that even people who violently disagree in the most personal of ways right. uh, can pass legislation. And if you just read American history, we just love this fight in Washington. It's just part of the, part of the discussion. The frustration we have, though, uh, talking to the editor of Politico here, is that we know to the smallest degree, uh, uh, to, to the microscopic level of what happens in debates. So if we didn't like Washington when we had only the evening news, imagine when you know play by play, moment by moment, how that sausage is made, right? And the American people like it even less because they know even more. And so that's a telltale lesson for me that we have to get things done. I'm glad the lesson isn't that we should know less. <laughs> right. Cecilia. I'm sorry, you, which part did you want to? I, no, I thought you wanted to jump back in on this question of uh, the inherent gridlock in the system or not. I, I mean, I have to admit that when it comes to how we've set up, um, you know, between the House and the Senate, which I think the, House, the Senate was designed to be a little bit more deliberative than the House, and it seems to me the House is always, is always working. But I think when we're thinking do nothing, we mean in terms of what actually gets passed. Um, I do think that there's, you asked from the academic side, there is some concern that in the U.S. Uh, that we, you know, part of it, if you look at our media, it's gotten more polarized. Um, and uh, that it, there's a feeling that our population's gotten more polarized and that there is less of an understanding, and not just in Washington, but that this is coming from the bottom up, and that that will have some consequences for our, for our, 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 you know, our, our, demo, our democracy. Um, that's a little bit gloom and doom, and I'm not saying that I think that we're you know, about to cave under the, you know, the weight of Rome or something, but I think that there is some concern that that polarization is actually reflecting more of what's ha happening around the country. Governor Hickenlooper, you come from a state that, uh, you know, obviously is a pretty contested state politically. Uh, it's, it's voted Democratic in national elections. It's, it's elected you. Uh, it just elected a new Republican senator as well. Uh, from the ground up, from the battleground state, uh, if you will, uh, do you see that gridlocked partisan outcomes in Washington are inevitable? Or how do you, how do you make policy that people can agree upon <coughs> when they disagree about so much uh, on their personal political views? Well, and part of it is the, the media is very polarizing. But I think go back and look at the time at Lincoln's re-election. You couldn't be any more polarizing than that. Right. Uh, there is a difference in the television, certainly, and, and all the visual media is, is a hot media. So, and, and the attack ads, you know, I'm, I'm fine. Andrew's heard me say, I said this the other day, that you don't, Coca-Cola would never do an attack ad against Pepsi. Pepsi sales would go down. It works. Pepsi would have no choice but to attack Coke. Coke sales would go down, they'd attack Pepsi, Pepsi would attack Coke. You depress the entire product category of soft drinks. And what we're doing is, is depressing the product category of democracy in a, in a certain funny way. And I think the way, at least on a state basis, you do that, you respond to that, is you try to persuade people. And, and I think this is what Cece, if I can be so bold, uh, she said because she was called Cece Absolutely. growing up. The, uh, <laughs> but the, that... Uh, uh, trying to persuade people to see a broader self-interest for themselves than they originally thought. And you were describing the president and Congress both having an overlapping self-interest in getting things done. And I think on a local level, that's, you know, when you're trying to persuade someone, you just have to listen harder and, and, and focus more on what their real concern is, because often it's different than what you think. And this is years in the restaurant business, that all of a sudden you say, oh, that's your problem. Well, heck, I don't care that much about that, and maybe we can work on this, and, and you end up with, again, a compromise that's not perfect for everyone, but that where enough self-interest overlaps so that you can, you can make real progress. Secretary Prisker, what is it, are, are you able to be in the solutions business while leading such a, a massive government agency right now? Absolutely. You know, remember, I come from the private sector, 27 years, this is my first government job. In the private sector, your job is to find solutions. Give me the facts, give me the lay of the land, and then I, your job is to figure out how to navigate. And I think what was, I, the reason that I'm optimistic is, is I think that there are overlapping self-interest, but there are also overlapping policy uh, positions at this point, and, and there's a desire to get things done. And I think there's a desire, and I think there's also a recognition that we should focus on where we can actually get things done. 
There's a, I, uh, some discipline going on. There may be, look, everyone's got their rhetoric and their political rhetoric, which is not my expertise. But in fact, if you listen carefully to where there's overlapping interests, you're seeing real progress happen. I think you'll see the trade agreements start to move uh, in very short order. There's work going on to see if we can have business tax reform. And I, you don't hear the kind of negative conversation. There's realistic conversation. These are challenging issues to resolve, and they require uh, uh, people to stake out what's important to them. The president's tried to do that on business tax reform. I think the Republican House and Senate are doing the same, looking for ways, is there enough overlap that we can make a deal? Because the American people want to see progress. They want to see the United States remain competitive, remain a leader in the global economy. Why? They want jobs. They want to do better. That's the number one. If you look at all the polling, what does it tell you? Americans want jobs. They want an opportunity. They want to believe that they can do better for their families. And that's our job, is to figure that out. And I think there's more listening that's going on, as the governor said, and said, you know what? Let, yes, there's rhetoric. And yes, there might be things that are said on either side that are being said for various political reasons. But there's also a lot of listening going on as to where the overlap is. And I, that's why I'm hopeful. It's a window, too. We will get into, ultimately, the national elections. And that will change the landscape uh, for the congressman and for the administration. And so we have to take advantage of the window that we've got. And that's why I also think there's a sense of urgency that I hear from the congressman is, let's take advantage of this moment. Let's focus on the things that we can actually get done. The, pa the, patient is, the patient is still not well, okay? So let, let's, mm -hmm. this, I, was my I, this optimism point that you were at before, I think the U.S. has gotten itself into a position to get well. 3% mm -hmm. uh, GDP growth we should not be celebrating. This economy's got a way more promise than that. The trade agreements and business tax reform will accelerate GDP. They have to be done. Unemployment rate's coming down, but there's a lot of people who've never worked. We've got to reschool the workforce big time. There are open jobs, Penny and I were chatting in the corridor, five million of them. Um, I can't get a welder to build plants in the United States without paying them $200,000 a year. Maybe that's what I should be paying them. 20% wage inflation in, in the technician area on the US Gulf Coast last year. Um, but we have unemployed people, so we've got to get reskilling done. It is a major issue that'll create growth. We've got to get at that work. It is jobs. You get reelected on jobs, you'll get elected on jobs. The states work because the states have had some more. In fact, we've gone to the states preferentially the last three or four years, like you know, Colorado. How much do you think that this inequality uh, issue in, in, in the American economy, does that affect your business in some real way? It affects my business because I can't get workers. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is absolutely ludicrous. So, so to that point, this yeah. was not much ballyhooed last year, but a Republican House, a Democrat Senate, and a Democrat president yeah. uh, cut the number of worker training programs we had took the money and threw it in a in more focused ways. It was a huge success. Exactly. I know, Penny, that you were very engaged in that. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the type of success that doesn't make headlines, but that's the real work that we've got to do. That's and that's a matter of finding that, that little opening that that's you right. can do something small but significant. Tangible. I think you're exactly and right. It's very <clears throat> tangible. And focusing is really, I think, the, the critical factor here. Let's not boil the ocean. Let's not try and get everything mm -hmm. done. Let's focus where we can have bi the biggest impact. And the skilled workforce, I mean, you've got a group of people here who are very focused on skilled workforce. I mean, Cecilia and I got first met one another when we did a set of focus groups on that ultimately led to creating Skills for America's Future, which ra really raised the awareness of the skills challenge that we're facing today. We have five million open jobs in America. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. We know today that in 2020, 35% of our workforce needs to have a BA in order to do the jobs that our business leadership is telling us they're going to have. We know another 30% need to have the technical skills and need to have at least some form of higher education. We're nowhere near meeting those needs. It's a real issue. The solutions, though, actually <clears throat> reside in the states and in the cities and in the regions. The federal government, what we can do together, which we did, was to really change the way grants work so that they're business-led and job-driven. 
So they're focused on, it's not about we're just going to give out money for training and pray that it's somehow it works, but instead it's focused. And that's where working together shows progress. And the congressman can go back to his district. I was in the Charlotte area, in fact, earlier this week, you know, and basically tout, hey, look, this is how government can actually function and work well together. And the employers can look and say, hey, look, this is working for me in the district. And this question of skills goes right back to mm -hmm. what you, you raised in the opening, which is uh, the middle class family, the median family in America has been left behind. Mm -hmm. The median wage for, uh, in, in our country is the same last year as it was in 1989, right? So they've been left behind by the great advances of the 90s and the, the first decade of the 2000s. And what is that big differentiation in the workforce? Skills, skills. And I say this uh, with all due respect as a, uh, uh, as a history major in, mm -hmm. in college. We can, right. we can retrain you too. Yeah. But, but. <laughs> no, you already have. <laughs> so a welder, it, what is fascinating to me is somebody with skills like He's like going to sign up for your welding job. Come, that's that's higher paid than that. congressman. Exactly. And um, that might be based on delivery, actually. <laughs> so, so that point, though, we need to focus on skills. And some, and some of us, as Republicans, we see the workplace flexibility piece as very essential for middle class families. Exactly. When the president brings up Child care. It is a big issue for me with a five-month-old, by the way, named Cecilia, <laughs> um, at home. Cece. And the struggles that families have, and my wife has a, a very good job and has done a fantastic, has a fantastic career. So we're, we're very blessed, but it is a struggle. It's a real struggle for families. So there are opportunities where we can figure out this path forward to get at this major issue that is a societal problem and not a Republican or Democrat problem, just a American. family problem in a country problem. So I want to bring the audience into it because I know you are going to have great contributions to make as well. I believe there's microphones uh, around. So if you just uh, raise your hands.